Did you read the uh, proverb for today? Today is the 27th, October 27th. Hmm, in a couple days, the blasphemous, satanic uh, Halloween is going to be upon us. Oh, joy. <laughs> but did you read the uh, proverb for today? Why not? If you did, praise the Lord. Proverbs chapter 27. Not going to labor too long in this one. <laughs> Got quite a bit we're going to be going through today. This is not the video that I wanted to do. But then again, I'm not in charge here. Okay, I am not in charge. The Lord is. Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures. And follow me along uh, through the scriptures that we will be looking at today. I expect you to. I expect you to. The authorized version, the King James Version, not a Bible. Okay? And I'm going to speak to you as if you are following me along. Okay? You got that? Proverbs chapter 27. To begin, just two verses. Five and six. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Open rebuke is better than secret love. You love America? Hmm. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. A friend, a true friend, will be used of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. I'm talking in context on to the Church of the Living God. A true friend will wound that pride of yours as used by our Lord Jesus Christ. Because it says here, faithful are the wounds of a friend. And if your friend is of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. And faithful are those wounds because our Lord is using that friend for your betterment in the end thereof. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful, which tell you God loves you. God's not angry at you. God's not going to judge you. Everybody's going to be saved. God's love is unconditional. That's the kisses of an enemy. Lord willing to you, my countrymen here in America, I speak to you as a friend. Because there are a lot of you diehard Americans who um, are in love with this country. But I want to ask you a very hard and difficult question. I want to ask you a really hard and difficult question. When was America ever, ever a godly nation? Hmm? Now let's make some dis uh, distinguishing things here. Godly. Hmm? What does it mean to be godly? Hmm? What does it mean to be godly? Turn in your authorized version of the scriptures to Psalm chapter 4. Psalm 4. Psalm 4. <laughs> See, I slip up sometimes. Psalms, the book of Psalms doesn't have chapters. I corrected my, uh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Psalm 4. Psalm 4. What does it mean to be godly? Hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. Not his own, but his, uh, my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. O ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory into shame? How long will ye love vanity and seek after leasing? Shelah. But know 
that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly, set apart, godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call on to him. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. That's talking of self-examination. And it says here, stand in awe. Um, if you fear the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding, you will be awed of the Lord. See, having this awe for the Lord comes from what? Fear. The fear of the Lord. Okay? And thus far that we've read in Psalm 4 here, okay, verse 1, O God of my righteousness, okay, and verse 2, O ye sons of men, in a general term, yes, but there are people out there who are religious and yet not converted, following the doctrines of men. And of course, verse 3. But know that the Lord has set apart separation. Him that is godly for himself, the Lord will hear when I call on to him. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There be many that say, who will shew us any good? Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. Thou hast put gladness in my heart, more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. So godly, someone who belongs unto the Lord, who fears the Lord, but also is separated, set apart from that. Godly. When was America ever truly a godly nation? Now the very first variation of the word godly appears in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 8. But that's ungodly. So the first reference of the word godly begins with it uh, equating to people who are ungodly. Isn't that interesting? A little bit more on godly. Uh, Psalm chapter... I almost did it again. Uh, Psalm 12. Psalm 12. Verse 1. Help, Lord. For the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. Godly, faithfulness, faithfulness unto our Lord, fearing the Lord, having understanding, departing from evil, dependent upon the Lord, not upon flesh, who love the Lord and fear him. Okay? Those are attributes what it means to be godly. Okay? They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. Defining what ungodly is. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. And the tongue that speaketh proud things, who have said, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sign of the needy. Now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them. Keep what? The words, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them, what? The words, from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. And Psalm 32, Psalm 32. Psalm 32. 
Psalm 32. A really good scriptural definition what it is to be godly. Psalm 32. Notice how short these psalms that uh, the word godly appears. And it, it, what's interesting in the psalms, godly without the prefix of ungodly. Godly appears three times in the psalms. I'm sure that's a coincidence. But ungodly, I didn't count how many times ungodly appears. But in the psalms, godly appears three times. Hmm, very interesting. Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Shilah. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Shilah. For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Now, from looking from verses 1 on to verse 6, again, more definition of what it is to be godly. Godliness. The only way that godliness can truly come is through the Lord himself. And that only comes through the Lord himself if you are truly saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God. Godliness, boop, hello, is equated unto God. There are those out there who can fake having separation, can fake godliness, but true godliness comes from brokenness, contrition, and fear of the Lord. Those three things. Three. But these three are one. Oh. See, those of you who are not of the Church of the Living God, but are the coadjutors, you lack in all three of those areas, which come, which extend from one event, in being saved by our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? You lack in that. <laughs> Quite extensively. But someone who is truly godly has God within them. So, in a way, when has America ever been a godly nation? Hmm. More on that in a bit. Let's continue this, though. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Shilah. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. And not the eye that's on the dollar bill, you wicked Freemasons. Jesuits, might as well be. Be ye not as the horse, or as the mule, which have no understanding, departing from evil, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be, to, shall be to the wicked. But he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. Upright in heart. Question. When has America ever been a godly nation? Truly a godly nation. Hmm. Well, Way back in, what was it, 16, uh, before that. But in the 1620s, the pilgrims who came over on the Mayflower, those pilgrims were Calvinists. Calvinism. K 
Calvinism. Puritanism is derived from Calvinism. And we have to remember that. And Calvinism, Calvinism, John Calvin taught a lot of good things. You see, you should do it. Uh, for example, some of the Puritans, and I've read uh, my share of Puritan writings, you know, Baxter, Owens, Sibbs, uh, and John Bunyan. How many of you have the Pilgrim's Progress? John Bunyan. He was a Puritan. Puritans were Calvinists. Puritanism came from Calvinism. John Calvin teaches elect and non-elect. That man has no say. Don't say that it's otherwise, you wicked Calvinists. That's what Calvin taught. That there is elect and non-elect. That you are going to go to heaven whether or not you can have anything to do with it. I mean, you don't have anything with your salvation. But God's forcing you at gunpoint to be saved. No. No. And hence the non-elect, God is forcing you into hell at gunpoint. No. No. And any of you out there who are teaching that, you're a heretic. You are a wicked, wretched heretic. Repent. Calvinism of pre, uh, the predestination, elect and non-elect that Calvin taught is heresy. Satanic heresy. And if you're teaching that, you are in heresy. You're a heretic. Repent. Okay? But... The Calvinists, the Puritan Calvinists that came over here in 1620, they were separatists, okay? They were separatists. They came over here primarily for what? To escape persecution from Rome. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the kids are being taught, especially, and since uh, Thanksgiving is coming up next month, you know, they are taught that uh, Puritans came over because they wanted to seek prosperity and a better life for themselves. Yeah, that had a part to do with it, but they first came over here to, uh, originally, primarily because of persecution from Roman Catholicism. Okay? And, of course, they made the Mayflower com, uh, Compact and whatnot. Okay? They settled in, what was that, Massachusetts, the, the Plymouth bre uh, Brethren. Okay? Our, very, our first ancestors, our ancestors here in America were Puritans, Calvinistic Puritans. Then you have the 1630s, where they started coming over here in droves. Now, these Calvinists were nonconformists. There's a difference between nonconformists and separatists, okay? The nonconformist Puritans of 1630, when they came over here, they didn't like the Roman rituals that were involved in the Church of England. Church of England is basically the English branch of Roman Catholicism. You look at how the Church of England was established. Bloop, there you go. What was it? King Henry VIII, I believe it was, right? Yeah, he started his own church, the Church of England, <laughs> while keeping all the things of popery. Absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, from that, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, all link unto the Church of England. Okay? And while there were Pres Presbyterians and Episcopalians that I do believe were uh, of the Church of the Living God, in and of themselves, they were derived from error. But see, there again, that does not mean that within that, there weren't those who were of the Church of the Living God. See, that's the distinguishing thing we need to get right out of the way at first here. I'm going to make an argument to you that America was never a godly nation. Yet, because of the Church of the Living God that was in, that is in America, God, because of his body that is here, Mercy has been shooed onto America because of the Church of the Living God. Okay? Were there some Calvinists way back when that were of the Church of the Living God? I believe so. Even though 
Um, they were they were in heresy over the Trinity because the Trinity is satanic. We're going to get into that a little bit. But you also got to remember that a lot of the Church of England slash Roman Catholic baggage that the nonconformists were trying to get away from in types they established here in America. So again, America as a whole. When was it ever a godly nation? When was it ever a godly nation? And not to mention before 1776, before we uh, declared our independence from England, okay? But even before that, the Jesuit Catholic influence was already rife within America. Already rife within America. Now, here are some resources I'm going to be sharing with you right here, okay? This book here, Washington in the Lap of Rome. This, um, this is a really, really good book. This is a, it's by this Justin D. Fulton. Um, you can get this off of Amazon for about eight bucks. Uh, this is a very good book. Here, this, this is what it is, okay? It's very basic. It tells you people the basic things of our nation that you as America, as you as Americans, really need to know. Okay? Because you got to remember what these, what the kids in the schools today are being taught are being taught by Jesuits. Okay? And Rome has long rewritten the history books, okay? Rome has rewritten history. And what the kids are being taught today are being taught by those who are in league with the Jesuits. Not everyone who is in the school systems of today is a Jesuit, no. But that school system, that school system, especially today, is run by the Jesuits. Was it always so? No. But it was an event. It was an eventuality. Now I'm going to read some things to you from this book. Okay, this this is going to be a bombardment uh, of information onto you with uh, some scripture as well. Of course, this may this may be a two part video. This may be a two part video. Okay. I'm going to read to you this right here, okay? Like I said, you, you can get this book off of Amazon for se uh, eight bucks. Get it, okay? But this right here, I'm going to read to you, okay? If you can see that, pause it and read it, okay? And then on the opposing page, <clears throat> I'm going to read... This whole page and up to where my finger is on the opposing page, okay? So, uh, how does that look? How does that look? Okay. Can you see that? Okay. okay. Pause that and read it. Let me see. Oh, okay. All right. Let's read this. Can the Jesuits be expelled, expelled from America? And remember, in the 1620s, the 1630s, the Jesuit order was already well established. They had been disbanded, but you think that they were not active. They were working through front groups, but they themselves were still there. Yeah, they were never di truly disbanded, only in pretense. They were all along still working. That was, a, that was a monster that was birthed that will only be destroyed by our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. A recent writer has said that in expelling the Jesuits, not alone all Protestant Americans would unite, but thousands upon thousands of the most intelligent members of the Roman Catholic Church would join hands. Jesuitism is almost as dangerous to them 
as to Protestants. And that's true. Got to look into history about what the 83 times or uh, the 83 nations that the Jesuits were expelled and a majority, a majority of those nations were Catholic nations. Yeah. But then again today, Jesuitism is Catholicism. Francis is a Jesuit, subservient unto Sosa. Sosa rules Catholicism. There is no religion in Jesuitism. It is foreign to the principles of the gospel in emissio to liberty, in emissio, I-N-I-M-I-C-A-L, to liberty, and a conspirator against the state. Because of their insatiate greed for power and influence, they have been feared, hated, driven out. It is believed that it will be so in this free land. Hmm. Unfortunately, no. Some deed will be performed, some word spoken, which shall uncover the traitor, when the American people will arise and make short work of the invader that seeks to crush out freedom, that despotism resting on ignorance, on superstition and error may thrive. They cry, the cry will yet be heard, expel the Jesuits, then vox pu populi shall be the vox day, whatever that means. Expel the Jesuits. Was there a time when that could have happened? Maybe. But look at America today. The Jesuits are not going anywhere. The Jesuits run this nation. <laughs> the Jesuits run this nation. Our government, you know, Kamala Harris, President Harris, and Smoking Joe, they are controlled by the Jesuit order. Okay? They are the puppets. Kamala is the puppet. The Jesuits, they are the puppet master. Okay? Now, reading on the opposing page that we looked at, how Washington came to be Washington. This few seem to know that many reckoned, that many reckon it happened so. Such are uh, oblivious to the fact that before even Washington was even a dream in the minds of men, Rome had plotted to hold the continent. By Rome, we mean the power that makes Rome what she is and what she is to be, the prince of the power of the air, who has, incar incar who has incarnated himself in Jesuitism. As Christ is incarnated in Christianity, the power that works in darkness and plans the suppression of the truth and the overthrow of the rule of Christ. For we wrestle not, says Paul, against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, and against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. John said, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. In this manifestation of Christ... Through the proclamation of the truth lies the hope of the world. If then we charge Romanism with being cunning, subtle, and sly, the reason for the charge is supplied in the words quoted, which inform us of the cunning craftiness whereby Rome lies in wait to deceive. And so do all those who work for her. The power un is unseen. It is shadowy. Yeah, these coadjutors, these Jesuits, they work in the shadows. And they use front people like Kamala Harris, Smoking Joe. It is shadowy. It, inhabit it inhabits the air and infects it. Romanism is the malaria of the spiritual world. I like that saying. Romanism is the malaria of the spiritual world. <laughs> it stupefies the brain. 
deadens the heart and sears the conscience as with a hot iron. It stands across the track of, of the world's life with gifts in its hands. All will be thine if thou fall down and worship me, what Satan said. With gifts in its hands, offering rule, supremacy, power, and wealth to all who will fall down, who will fall down, fall down. This is a misprint. To all who will fall down and worship her. They who yield have peace and praise. Don't you, you wicked coadjutor devils who work for the Vatican? Yeah. Yeah, keep smiling, buddy. They who refuse must fight a desperate foe. <laughs> That's why I have no respect for anyone who started out strong, but then out of cowardice goes and joins the enemy. Got no respect for you whatsoever. No respect for you. You're an enemy. Joining yourself with the enemy? No respect. No respect for you. The many that the many do not believe this. They are blinded by ambition and fear, and they see it not. Deaf are they, and they hear not the truth, and yet the truth remains. The what is is the outgrowth of the what has been. Don't forget it. Amen. Amen to that. A wise, astute Cunning, comprehensive intellect has helped Romanism in the past and is helping it now. Amen. Got to remember, a lot of the people that work for the, for the Roman Catholic Church, for the Jesuits, these are intelligent men. Look at the enemies of our Lord, the coadjutors here on YouTube. These are intelligent men. Yeah, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. But yeah, they are intelligent men. <laughs> Bravo for you. Let's continue. Washington is in the lap of Rome because of influences which stirred the hearts of people and made them to act worse than they knew. A few facts will make all this plain. Columbus, who was a Catholic... Columbus was actuated by a desire to promote the interests of Romanism when he traversed an unknown sea and discovered this Western world. And that is not true. Life Erickson was before Christopher Columbus. Life Erickson, okay? Not Columbus. It was Life Erickson that first discovered the continent for Japheth, okay? Not of Shem, okay? When he, okay, Cortez and Pizarro went to Mexico and Peru and captured them for the same purpose. Cortez, Catholic. Pizarro, Catholic. Yeah. What about the uh, Aztecs? Hmm? Their lives were full of cruelty, but that did not hurt them with Rome. Lord Baltimore came to Maryland to find a refuge for persecuted Romanists and named the place of retreat Mary's Land, the state of Maryland. So of the original 13 and we look into the original 13, like Vermont and New Hampshire, <laughs> um, they trace back to Catholicism. Even though, even though there were some who were not of Rome, obviously, you can't be a Roman Catholic and be saved. It's impossible. Like Alberto Rivera said, you cannot go from Christ to Rome. You can come from Rome to Christ, but you cannot come, you cannot be from Christ to go to Rome. That's impossible. 
because Christ and Rome have nothing to do with each other. Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, has nothing to do with Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism is Satan's church. Okay? Within Maryland and all these uh, of the 13 states, um, of the original 13 states, the Church of the Living God was there, but their governments, their governments, that's what we're talking about. That's the distinguishing thing, okay? To escape the fangs of Romanism and priestly intolerance, the Puritans forsook their homes beyond the sea, came to New England, and on Plymouth Rock built an altar to liberty, sought on bleak New England shores freedom to worship God. They have been called narrow in their thought, and it is claimed they meant by liberty, liberty for themselves and the right to banish all who thought differently. You know in the Constitution, the very first amendment that talks about freedom of religion? And people use that freedom of religion to justify the worship of devils. But I'm going to suggest unto you that at the initial beginnings, that liberty um, was not a liberty to give place unto Rome. Because look what has happened. Rome has infected America. Okay? Rome has infected America. Now, now, I'm going to read a little out of this book. If you can get this book, this, this, this book will open your eyes too. See? And, uh, if you can get a screenshot of this, let me get my face out of the way. Get a screenshot of that, pause it, you know, get a screenshot, and then zoom in on it, uh, uh, you know, once you get the screenshot. Um, some of these symbols, look at that. We're going to be reading about Maryland, which we just heard about. Maryland. This is before the um, American Revolutionary War, okay? This is when the Puritans came over. Maryland was, oh, oh, here. Let me, let me show you what I'm reading. I'm going to be reading this whole page, okay? Up to Right there, where my finger is, okay? Then we're going to read... <laughs> about the 1649 Maryland Toleration Act. We're going to be reading this whole page onto where my finger is, okay? So... And here, see where my finger is? That's where we're going to be reading to. Oh, here. Pause and read it. Okay. What about Maryland? Maryland, huh? Yeah. Maryland was founded as a colony for persecuted Catholics in 1632. And remember, the second wave of the Puritan Calvinists came in 1630. So, two years after. In a country that was birthed to get away from Roman Catholic persecution. Hmm. Maryland was founded as a colony for persecuted Catholics in 1632 by Cecil Calvert and his brother Leonard Calvert. It was named for King Charles I's wife, Harrietta Maria, who was a French Catholic 
Religious tensions of that era were such that the Puritans of Boston would not allow Calvert into their port after his transatlantic, transatlantic voyage. Amen! In 1644, during the Civil War in England, Virginia Anglicans Richard Ingle and William Claiborne led an attack on Maryland's St. Mary's City, burned the church, took control of the government, government, and imprisoned the Catholic leaders. Leonard Calvert returned with a small force, drove out the marauders, and reestablished his authority. The population of Maryland in 1645 was between 4,000 and 5,000, with three-fourths being Catholics. There were four Franciscan priests, followed by four Jesuit priests. After Leonard Calvert died in 1647, Cecil appointed Protestant governor William Stone in 1648. Cecil granted the Toleration Act of 1649. What does a cat? Why would a Catholic appoint a Protestant over a state that was founded as a refuge for persecuted Catholics? Why? Why would that happen? Hmm. Okay. Cecil granted the Toleration Act of 1649, which allowed any Christian to hold office. Any Christian! Oh, what's a Christian? <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what. I ain't a Christian. Remember? Catholics are Christians. Calvinists are Christians. Lutherans are Christians. Methodists are Christians. Baptists are Christians. Did I say Catholics are Christians? You know, being godly, separate, godly, not having a melting pot of all things. When was America a godly nation? Yeah, okay. Cecil granted the Toleration Act of 1649, which allowed any Christian to hold office. This was the first instance instance of freedom of conscience in colonial America. A few years earlier, Virginia's House of Burge Burgesses passed a law requiring all persons to conform to the Church of England. So forcing people into religion at gunpoint. Liberty of conscience. You're free to worship God as you so choose. But you got to remember, the original intent of liberty of conscience, was that equated onto Rome? Does Rome give on to anyone outside of her liberty of conscience? Oh, yeah, sir! And their, their fictitious little Vatican too. Yeah, yeah. But is liberty of conscience, conscience there for Rome? I've said before, you know, if you're a Catholic and you are choosing to believe that satanic lie you call a religion and give yourself on to it after hearing the truth of your damnable heresies that's damning you to hell, if you want to continue to, uh, to be in that and not causing harm or hurting other people, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Good luck at the great white throne of judgment. Go ahead. Yeah. You, you stay on that side of the street, I'm going to stay here. You come over here, I'm going to mess with you. Okay? <laughs> but all the while, I'm going to warn people of your deadly disease of a religion. Okay? Just so you know. But if you're going to not come to a, the true, true faith on our Lord Jesus Christ, and you're not harming anyone or whatever, but then again, spreading your faith, of Catholicism, which is already uh, prevalent here in America? How far do we go with liberty of conscience, brethren? 
How far do we go? See, here in America right now, I have the freedom to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, God our Father, openly. But when Catholicism rules, which it is ruling but not openly, even thus, I would still worship and serve our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. How far do we go with this liberty of conscience? Let's continue this. A few years earlier, Virginia's House of Virginia, uh, okay. Virginia's governor strictly enforced this law, resulting in many Puritans and Quakers fleeing. Governor William Stone invited these refugees to Maryland and gave them a large tract of land where they founded Annapolis. The Puritans complained that their consciences would not allow them to submit to a Catholic government. So in 1650, they seized the colony's government and repealed the Toleration Act. What is this Toleration Act? As you saw, the Toleration Act. Sixteen forty nine Maryland Toleration Act. Get a load of this. Get a load of this. For as much as in well governed, uh, for as much as in a well governed and Christian Commonwealth, matters concerning religion and the honor of God ought in the first place to be taken into serious consideration and endeavored to be settled. Be it therefore ordered and enacted by the right honorable Cecilius, Cecilius, Lord Baron of Baltimore, absolute Lord and proprietary of this providence, with the advice and consent of this General Assembly, that whatsoever person or persons within this providence of the islands thereunto belonging shall from henceforth blaspheme God, that is, curse him, or, get this, or deny our Savior Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, or shall deny the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, or the Godhead of any of the said three persons, of the Trinity, or until, or the unity of the Godhead, or shall use or utter any reproachful speeches, words, or language concerning the said Holy Trinity, or any of the said three persons thereof, shall be punished with death and confiscation or for forfeiture of all his or her lands and goods in the Lord to the Lord proprietary and his heirs. So, Maryland was a, this is a tolera toleration act. But see, see the hypocrisy? If you didn't believe in the satanic three person, and we're going to look at that, the three person trinity, what is a person, a spirit, soul, and body? We'll get into that a little later, okay? If you rejected the satanic trinity, they would put you to death. Calvinists would put people to death, just like Roman Catholics did. So, liberty, meaning for themselves, and to banish all others who didn't believe as they believed. That, I believe, brethren, was the original intent of what liberty is. Liberty to worship God as we see fit. Does that mean that, does that give way to Catholicism? Well, you look into the Constitution, the very First Amendment. Yes, according to our Constitution, according to that thing, the Constitution, yes, that means Catholics could be here and worship Satan and worship Semiramis. That means is uh, Muslims can be here and worship 
a system that was given to them by Rome. That means the Hindus, the Buddhists, okay? They can worship devils because America allows it under the First Amendment. But it seems today that they're really fighting against those who want to worship the God of the Scriptures, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Let's continue with this. And be it, and this is where it's really going to, and be it also enacted by the authority, uh, and be it also enacted by the authority, and with the advice, uh, with the advice and assent aforesaid, that whatsoever person or persons shall from henceforth use or utter any reproachful words or speeches concerning the blessed Virgin Mary, the mother of our Savior, or the holy apostles or evangelists. Mary. It's Mary's land. And this was in 1649. And as we heard already, that there were Jesuits there. Only four of them. Or something like that. Could such a little number of men make such a broad influence? Oh, you better believe it. Or any of them shall in such case for the first offense forfeit to the said Lord Proprietary and his heirs and his heirs lords and proprietaries of this provenance the sum of five pounds sterling or the value thereof to be levied on the goods and cattles c-h-a-t-t-e-l-s of every such person so offending but in case such offender or offenders shall not then have goods and cattles sufficient for the satisfying of such forfeiture or that the same be not otherwise speedily satisfied, that then such offender or offender shall be publicly whipped and be imprisoned during the pressure, during the pleasure of the Lord Proprietary or the Lieutenant or Chief Governor of this provenance for the time being. So freedom of religion... And it brought the worship of devils. you got to remember, too, and I'm reading from this book. This book, like I've told you before, is out of print. But if you can find it, get it. When it comes to the signing of our Constitution, okay, you have to remember something, people. Our founding fathers, as it were, were Freemasons. You don't see the name of Jesus Christ mentioned on our Constitution. Why? Because these people were Freemasons. Okay? Freemasons. They worship the great architect, not the God of the Scriptures. Okay? Uh, but... We're going to read a little in this Constitutional Convention. I'm going to read this right here, where my finger is. Okay. Pause that and read it. Then we're going to read up to where my finger is on the opposing page. Pause it and read it. I won't trouble you with that disgusting heretic, uh, Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin, who was a Freemason, okay? Benjamin Franklin, a disgusting Freemason, who was the governor of Pennsylvania. He was a Freemason. He worshipped at every altar, <laughs> okay? Uh, Benjamin Franklin was not, a free, uh, was not a saved man. And I've offended people before in the past by saying that. Benjamin Franklin is in hell. Okay? But, Constitutional Convention, September 7th, 1787, called for a vote on the new Constitution. 
39 of the 35 delegates at the Constitutional Convention signed the Constitution by June 21, 1788. Nine of the states had ratified it, establishing the Constitution. All of the states had completely had completed ratification by January 10th, 1791. Virtually all of the 55 writers and signers of the United States Constitution of 1787 were members of Christian denominations. Now, get this. Get this spread of Christians. 29 were Anglicans. Church of England. 16 to 18 were Calvinists. Two were Methodists. Two were Lutherans. Two were Roman Catholic. One lapsed Quaker and sometimes Angl Angl Anglican. And one open deist. Dr. Franklin, who attended every kind of worship, and that one video where we go through about um, the Jesuits' plan, I'll link it in this video, uh, talk about how the Freemasons worship at every altar, just like the Jesuits, because the Freemasons are controlled by the Jesuits, okay? Okay? But Dr. Franklin, who attended every kind of Christian worship, called for public prayer and contributed to to all denominations, including Catholics. Why? Because Benjamin Franklin was a Freemason. He was not a saved man. He is in hell. Benjamin Franklin was an evil man. But see, he was ecumenical. Ecumenical. Okay? Now, you got to remember the Calvinist Baptists of 1634, which wrote the Baptist Catechism, which I have, okay? Uh, you don't see Baptists mentioned in there, do you? Not that Baptist, you know, uh, what was his name, Roger Williams or whatnot, but this is way after his time. But uh, there were no Baptists there. There were Anglicans, Calvinists, Methodists, Lutherans, Catholics, Of these 55 writers and signers of the United States Constitution, were any of these of the Church of the Living God? Is it possible? Yes. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I believe it is possible. But you look at that, about 29 were Anglicans, 16 to 18 were Calvinists, two were Methodists, two were Lutherans, two were Roman Catholic, and one was a Quaker or and sometimes an Anglican, unstable in all his ways, and one open deist, and then it has a line, Dr. Franklin, who attended every kind of Christian worship. The Constitution of the United States of America, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Article 1, Section 7, Paragraph 2. If any bill shall not be returned by the president within 10 days, Sundays exempted, done in convention by the unanimous consent of the states present, the 17th day of September, in the year of our Lord, 1787. So, the question being asked again, when was America ever truly a godly nation? That does not mean that there weren't men of God, of the Church of the Living God, within there that influenced these deists. But in and of itself, was America ever a godly nation? I don't think so. The blessings and mercy that we here in America have received, it is because 
The church of the living God is in this nation. But you saw, especially in Maryland in 1634, or in 1649, excuse me, their Toleration Act. Toleration. But yet, if someone didn't believe in the Trinity, you would be put to death. Is that true toleration? The First Amendment of our Constitution, which guarantees us the liberty to live our lives according to the Scriptures as if we needed that. So if any man is in Christ, he is the Lord's free man. The Calvinists put people to death. They instituted laws contrary to the Scripture. Our Constitution, loosely based upon scriptural principles. I say loosely, because if it were truly based on principles of scriptures, of the scriptures, why is there no mention of Jesus Christ? Because the Constitution was drafted and written by Freemasons, who are being controlled by Rome. Absolutely. So from our inception, Rome has had a, a part to play in it. And Rome herself hates that. Hates the Constitution. But see, there were doors and windows open. So eventually, eventually, as it is the case today, that Roman Catholicism could come in and take over, as it has already done. Get your authorized version of the scriptures and turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. We will be reading verses 5 on to verse 10. Follow me along. John chapter 14, verses 5 on to verse 10. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. As I have said to you before, verse 6 you religious people, you Christians, you have a real big problem with this. Oh, how dare you? Oh, I dare. Oh, I dare. You know why? Because this is a statement of exclusivity. Exclusivity. Jesus Christ is excluding everything else but himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Okay? And our Lord said, Unless ye believe I am he, meaning God the Father, ye shall die in your sins. But no, we, we looked at uh, in Maryland about that Trinity. The Calvinists, the Puritans, they were Trinitarians. Every single one of them. That, that, that of writings, not every single one. I don't make. Were they? I don't know. The writings of the Puritans that I have read, every single one of them was a uh, Trinitarian. Every single one. Were there Puritans who were not Trinitarians? I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know. Were there Trinitar uh, Puritarians, uh, Puritans, excuse me, that were of the Church of the Living God? Yes, I believe so. They could have well died in error of thinking of who God is. Why is that? Why is that? See, that's that Roman Catholic baggage that came over here. And you got to remember too, brethren, uh, those on the Mayflower in 1620 when they came over here uh, to America and even earlier... Uh, the Puritan separatists, the pilgrims on the Mayflower, 
They did not have the authorized version of the scriptures with them. <gasps> no. They had the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible with the um, notes and whatnot primarily dictated by Calvin. In the one video about predestinated not to be elect or not, whatever, the video that was done on uh, Calvinism, we read out of the Geneva Bible, which is slighted to fit John Calvin's agenda. And you got to remember, brethren, too, most of the reformers did not seek that this Protestant Reformation would be what it was. They wanted to reform, not to do away with. Hey, you cannot deny that. God used the Protestant Reformation. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. For what purpose? To get the scriptures into the hands of the common folk. Absolutely. God has used America. God's blessing was on America. And what blessing remains is because of the church of the living God, which is in America. That today, because of the trading with the enemy act, okay, that has been set aside. That's a guideline. Okay, the Constitution, that's a guideline. Which can be circumvented because of the trading with the enemy act. Okay, started in what was it, 1907? But Roosevelt, Roosevelt, who really brought it to power, brought it to strength, and it's never been rescinded. Presidents have added on to it. Why do you think Kamala Harris, why, excuse me, why do you think the Jesuits through Kamala Harris, through Smoking Joe, have circumvented that thing? Why? Because it doesn't mean anything. The Jesuits have won in America. On a whole, individually, that's a different story. That's a totally different story. And hence, what we're getting at, individually, you. You know, John, uh, Eric John Phelps says, believes that this America can come back. Mr. Phelps is crazy when it comes to that. I used to think Mr. Phelps was crazy for thinking that China would one day invade America. Well, that's what, what's going on up in Canada. Uh, that is a very po good possibility. And on to Mr. Eric John Phelps, which I've never talked to him and I probably wouldn't want to. He wouldn't want to talk to me because the Trinity is satanic. And the Reformation was there to reform Catholicism, not to abolish it. But I, I publicly, you know, admit that I was wrong for thinking that Eric John Phelps was crazy for thinking that China could invade America. That's a real possibility. But, forgive that rabbit trail. Verse 6 talks about exclusivity. Jesus excluding every other thing except himself. And verse 7. If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. And henceforth, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, shew us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest, then thou, how sayest thou then, shew us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The soul of the Godhead. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, dwelleth in me, the soul of the Godhead, he doeth the works. Now go to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, not Habakkuk. Mark chapter 7. Here, here, here's, the, here's the crux of it all. Mark chapter 7, 
verses 7 on to verse 13. Let's begin at verse 6. Okay? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he said unto Thomas, uh, Have I not been so long time with you, and yet you have not known me, Philip? Those who have seen me have seen the Father. Jesus is the Father. Okay? Jesus is the Father. One God, comprised of spirit, soul, and body. Okay? One God. Not three persons that make one God. But Puritan Calvinists. I would be put to death by the uh, Puritans. Why? Because I spit on the Trinity. It's satanic. They would put me to death. The Calvinists, the Puritan Calvinists would put me to death, just like Roman Catholics would, for uh, spitting on their satanic Trinity. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me, beg your pardon. And we saw in Maryland, Maryland, Toleration Act, right? But if someone didn't believe in the Trinity, and especially the Roman Catholic Mary, death and banishment? Hmm. And liberty of conscience, that you are free to worship God as you so choose. Does that include Catholicism? They're Christians, aren't they? But they don't, they don't worship the true God. But see, the problem is, brethren, because of our very first amendment, which was, I believe, the original intent was, as we looked at, for we who are uh, saved to worship God according to the dictates of Scripture. Not to allow Roman Catholicism reign, because look, what has happened to America ever since Roman Catholicism had its foot in the door? And what has happened when religion that is flavored with Catholicism, like Anglican, like the Anglican churches, the Church of England? What happens? Mark chapter 7, verses 6 on to verse 13. He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. You ever read, hey, you ever read... <laughs> The Institutes of the Christian Religion by John Calvin. Hmm. You know, big, big part. You know, I've read Hagel before. And Hagel, oh, wow. If you've ever read Hagel, you know, the Hegelian principle, uh, what is it? Uh, thesis, antithesis, antithesis, synthesis, you know, controlling both sides of the argument to control the outcome, okay? But if you've ever read Hagel, that is a wordy, complex, nose-bleeding, mind-numbing attempt of someone who thinks he's something when he is not, only to say, yea, hath God said. That's basically summing up what Hagel is and his philosophy. I long got rid of that stuff. That's the, duh. But you read Calvin's Institutes on the Christian Religion, he makes a lot of good points. Yes, he does. He even kind of gives lip service to the actual God who is, but yet defend the three-person trinity. John Calvin was a philosopher. I don't think John Calvin was a saved man. I don't think Martin Luther was a saved man. Oh, <gasps> Brad! Martin Luther started the Reformation. Who started it? What, God would use an ungodly man, Brad, or someone not saved? He spoke to an ass, didn't he? 
He establishes people who are, are not of him for judgment against nations when he um, ordains them uh, to power, being allowed, you know, Satan to put these guys in power. Yeah, God will use lost people for judgment. Yeah. And God used, absolutely, God used Martin Luther. Yes, he did. With his, uh, what is a stricter version of the scriptures, you know, his translation or whatever, which was one of the seven purifications. God used John Calvin. Yes, he did. But were they saved men? I don't think so. I don't believe so. I would be shocked to see Martin Luther in heaven. And when we're up there and I see him, I will apologize. <laughs> okay? Uh, if Of course. I mean, we're not going to have that kind of problem in heaven. But I don't believe Martin Luther was a saved man. You ever read about what he said about the worship of Mary? You ever read about what he said about baptism? Huh? He was a saved man. Don't buy it. I don't buy it. Calvin, in his voluminous Christ, uh, Institute of the Christian Religion, and he was a saved man? What? I doubt it. I doubt it. I doubt it. But see, verse 7, Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. The reformers wanted to reform Catholicism. What came of that was something totally different than what the reformers themselves had imagined. Absolutely. And God has used the Reformation. Absolutely. How do you know? Because you have the scriptures available to you. Did God have a hand in establishing America? Yes. Because the church of the living God is in America because of his body. He cannot deny himself. Getting up, uh, uh, shacking up with your roots as a reformer, huh? Be careful, boy. Verse 8. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. See, the Puritans, they wanted to get to sola scriptura. But when you look into, especially, you know, the great Puritans such as Baxter, Owens, Sibbs, and Bunyan, okay? They wanted to institute their own doctrines. Not all of them. Not all of them. John Bunyan, I believe, was one of those exceptions who was actually saved in heaven, absolutely, with the Pilgrim's Progress. Yes, Sibs, I believe, is also in he uh, heaven. Baxter, eh, don't know. Uh, Owens, don't know. But still, again, the big main movers and Quakers, if you will, of the Puritans. They wanted to get away from the Roman rituals, but they wanted to establish their own rituals. That's the problem with Puritanism. That's why Puritanism didn't get that far. That's why if you try to adhere to the tenets of Puritanism and try to adhere those to the scriptures, you're going to have problems. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pot, pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, that is to say a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be, mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother. Hence, hence is an in there. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, 
which ye have delivered, and many such like things ye do, do ye. Like I said, you read Owens, you read Sibs, you read Baxter, John Bunyan, you can, you know, the Pilgrim's Progress, and I do believe John Bunyan was of the Church of the Living God, just messed up with the uh, Trinity thing. Okay? A lot of the Puritans, through Calvinism, while they wanted to separate themselves from Rome, they kept a lot of the Romish baggage. Same with the Episcopalians, um, Anglicans, Methodists, and such the like. Because remember, Catholics are Christians. And as we uh, heard in, the, uh, in Maryland, one of the 13th uh, original states was founded by a Catholic. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 10 on to verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, this is hardly the modern ecumenicalism of Vatican Council II. Hardly. Because, see, in order for ecumenicalism to work, you have to put this away. You have to compromise in truth. Paul is not talking about a compromise in truth. What he is talking about is putting away doctrines of men. Prove it to you. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul. Oh, you're a Calvinist. And I of Apollos. Oh, you're a Methodist. And I of Cephas. You're a Lutheran. And I of Christ. Is Christ divided was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanas. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Wisdom of words spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. When you look into history about the inception of the Trinity, you know the very first thing that the Roman Catholic Church went at its inception, when it came to be, to came to power, you know what the very first thing that they started teaching was way back then and what was it, the 300s or whatever it was? You know what the first thing that they started teaching one God comprised of three persons. Look that up. You don't believe me. That was the very first thing that Catholicism started to teach. Openly. One God comprised of three persons. Heresy! And you look into the teaching of the Trinity. Trinity is not here. Godhead is spirit, soul, and body. Godhead is not Trinity. Um, things that are different are not the same. Brad, why are you harping on this thing about the Trinity? Our Calvinist ancestors would have killed me. And those of you who believe in the scriptural Godhead, they would have killed you. Catholics, psh, they're going to kill anybody who doesn't agree with them. But the Puritans, they would have done the same thing. They would have done the same thing. 
Again, I ask you, when was America ever truly a godly nation? The Church of the Living God is in America, even way back when. Yes, it was. And that few did dictate on occasion, obviously, because it was of God. But on a whole, at the upper echelons, was America ever a godly nation? I don't think so. I don't believe so. And you look at today, the ecumenicalism wants to do away with truth. You compromise truth in order to have ecumenicalism. When Paul is saying, no, by truth, you have true unity by the scriptures. Well, which one, right? Right? The authorized version of the scripture is not a Bible. But what denomination, right? Is Christ divided? There is only one body. There is only one church. There is only one Lord. The church of the living God. Anything else? You're in error. Yeah. Look at me. Yeah, you're a Methodist, you're an error. You're a Quaker, you're an error. You're a Calvinist, <laughs> you're an error. You're a Baptist? Yeah, you're an error. Freedom of religion, the freedom to worship the Lord Jesus Christ as dictated by your conscience. But see, the original intent was that conscience dictated by the scripture. And not our interpretation. Because uh, now look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 3 unto verse 11. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereupon, thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is... Jesus Christ. How come the spirit that is within the church of the living God that will open the eyes of the church of the living God, the body of Christ, onto the truth of the satanic trinity, how come that spirit, which is the Lord, which are in a lot of these so-called Christians, how come he doesn't open their eyes onto that? How come what these Christians who claim to be of the church of living God are still adamant about worshiping buildings, worshiping in buildings, and holding to a denomination? You're a proud Baptist, huh? You're a proud anything? Yeah. Why is that? Remember, God isn't at, at gunpoint forcing you to do anything. Amen. Neither is Satan. See, our Lord has given us liberty. Absolutely. Absolutely. But he wants us to choose him. Not at gunpoint. Was America ever a godly nation? Hmm? Go to 1 John chapter 2 now. 1 John chapter 2. 
First John chapter 2, verses 12, verses 18 on to verse 29. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. This is what the falling away is, by the way. Those who said that they were of us, but they were not made, that they were not of us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. This is the falling away. This is what is happening and has been happening, but even more so now at this late hour. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Have I not been so long time with you, and yet ye have not known yet you have not known me, Philip? See, you can't separate our Lord Jesus Christ from the Father because he is the Father. And see, that's exactly what Trinitarians do. Because look at how they react. Hey, Trinitarian, Jesus Christ is the Father. Trinitarian, Jesus Christ is not the Father. Eh? Whoa, little, little vehement there, are you, huh? Trinity is Catholic. Babylonian, Egyptian, Catholic. Okay? It extends from that line of Nimrod. Okay? Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning, and that which ye have heard from the beginning, if that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. Look at verse 20. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, the Spirit of truth, he will lead you, and he will guide you into all truth. <laughs> Don't worry, we're going to look at that. And is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. See, God is in us. But see, we need to abide in him. Go to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Where are you going, Brad? John chapter 16. Come on, fingers, work with me. John chapter 16. We will be reading verses 7 on to verse 16. Our Lord speaking about the Holy Ghost himself. Oh! <gasps> Now, remember here in John, 1 John chapter 2, 
Verse 20, but ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Okay? And verse 27. Uh, verse 24. Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. John chapter 16, verses 7, on to verse 16. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. But, but it says elsewhere that the Father will send him. But our Lord says right here, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. You don't say. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he... The Spirit of truth has come. He will guide you into all truth. You have an unction and the anointing that you have, which teacheth you all things. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he, shall sh and he will shew you things to come. He shall glorify me. For he shall receive of mine, and shall shew it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall shew it unto you. A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, ye shall see me. And ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Now, go, to John, go back to John chapter 14. Verses 15 and 18. On to verse 18. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father. And he shall give you another comforter. That he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot receive. Because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him. But ye know him. For he dwelleth with you. And shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So okay. I will pray the Father. And he shall give you another comforter. That he may abide with you forever. Verse 18. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. John 16. Ah, uh, where, where was where, where, where was that? Or no, excuse me, excuse me. That was John. What's that? Yeah, verse seven, in John sixteen. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go away, the Comforter will not come. But if I depart, I will send him on to you. Hmm. Okay. Now go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. The Godhead Trinity issue is a very big problem because the Trinity is satanic. There are not three persons that make one God. That is satanic. There is one God comprised of spirit, soul, and body. You and I are made in the image of God. Not cookie cutters though, right? 
Because else we would all look the same. God is spirit, soul, and body, not three persons. A person is a spirit, soul, and body. We're made in God, God's image. The Puritans were Trinitarians. Do you want me to believe that no one way back when of the Church of the Living God, you want me to believe that no one believed truly on the scriptural Godhead? See, these Catholic coadjutors want to tell you that Brian Denlinger was the one who came up with this. <laughs> no. This is what the scriptures teach. The scriptures does not teach one God comprised of three persons. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 on to verse 14. In whom, we, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the pro purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. I'll link the Calvinism video in this, okay? Just so you know, watch that video, you have questions. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Sealed. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Sealed. Once saved, always saved. Sealed with the Holy Spirit, with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest. You could say unction. Oh. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption, the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble, of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Sealed. In this dispensation. See, under the law, this seal of the Holy Ghost was not there. It was not there. It was in type signified by circumcision. But see, circumcision under law was not a guarantee that the Holy Ghost would be in you permanently as it is today if you come to him on his terms, broken and contrite. And in fear of the Lord, call upon the name of the Lord. And if the Lord will, he saves you. And he will make you a new creature. But see, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit of promise. Okay? Okay? Now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 on to verse 18. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it, the heart, shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. Sanctify them, John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He has magnified his word above all his name. How do you learn the name of the Lord? Through the scriptures, the authorized version. And the spirit of truth, he will lead you, guide you into all truth. Now, verse 17. Now, the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 
liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory, glory of man, to glory, the glory of the Lord, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Going from one glory, the glory of man, unto the glory of our Lord. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Well, why are we looking at this, Brad? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verses 15 on to verse 23. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. This, in my humble opinion, is a very good implica implication of liberty of conscience. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And the Lord is that Spirit, that Holy Spirit of promise. You have the Lord living within you, that circumcision made without hands. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men, that these lost people may behold the Lord who dwells within you. Okay? Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit. Someone of the church of the living God can quench the Spirit that lives within them. Can you imagine quenching God that dwells within them? Otherwise, how could someone of the church of the living God for a prolonged time, mess around and be indoctrinated in the false doctrine of the Trinity. How is that possible? Unless because of how they were ingrained from the inception of Roman Catholicism and not totally abandoning the baggage of Catholicism that bled into the Anglican Church, the Church of England. I believe that we will see in heaven many of those of the Church of the Living God who on this issue of the Trinity and Godhead did just that, verse 19. Quenched their spirit religion. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, pay attention, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You have a spirit, a soul, and a body. God has a spirit, a soul, and a body. We are made in the image of God. There is no trinity. That is satanic. There is no trinity. None whatsoever. Go to 1 John chapter 5. Go to 1 John chapter 5. Remember in 1 John chapter 2, uh, you, uh, uh, verse 20, But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Why is that? Because you have the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is that Spirit, the Comforter. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come unto you. You have Jesus Christ living within you. And he will lead you and guide you into all truth. 
Okay? Now, go to the Johannian comma. John, 1 John 5, verses 1 and verse 12. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Oh, many people believe. The devils also believe and tremble. Semicolon. Or continuing the thought here in the sentence. Whom, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Is there a condition to this? Because the devils also believe and tremble. Uh, James chapter 2 verse 19. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. Loving God. So see, many people believe like these satanic easy believism devils. The devils also believe and tremble. <laughs> okay? But see, and everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. How can you love someone whom you're not afraid of? How can you love someone whom you have no fear of? How can you love God if you're not afraid of him? And see, the devils also believe, but they have no fear of God. Oh, they're good. Yeah, they tremble. Absolutely. Absolutely. It says they believe and tremble. But see, wisdom. What is wisdom? The fear of the Lord. That is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. So the fear of God is wisdom. And the fear of God is going to make you depart from evil. To be a separatist and a nonconformist. Not allowing baggage of Rome in. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous unto us. God does not save you so that you can live by the dictates of your own conscience or whatever. No. He's given us a standard to live by. Okay? And there are many commandments for us today of the Church of the Living God to live by. Absolutely. See, the Christians and the easy believism devils, they want you to live by your own conscience, void of Scripture. Of course, the Christians want you to read a Bible, not the Scriptures. Okay? There are many commandments for us. We don't keep them to be saved or stay saved. We already looked. Okay? When you come to the Lord on his terms, broken and contrite and in fear of the Lord, call upon the name of the Lord and he save you and make you a new creature. Okay? You are sealed until the day of redemption. The Lord lives within you. You are once saved, always saved. You can't get messed up because why? You can quench the spirit. And God can hand you over to kill you. Or to correct you. Hopefully to be corrected. Okay? But people can quench the spirit. Absolutely they can. Absolutely they can. But see, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Are, are not grievous. Excuse me. Grievous. There's no I in grievous. So, it's not a bad thing. It's not a hard thing. For you as the church of the living God to live your life according to this. But where does the problem come in? Oh, through religion? Through Catholicism? Through the flesh? The skin suit? Which Satan is all about? For whatsoever. Note that it doesn't say whomsoever. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh? Though he, who is he that overcometh the world? 
but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. And this is a verse that people like to uh, come to to say that you need to be dunked in water to, in order to be saved, which is Catholic, okay? Which is Catholic. The Pentecostals, Acts 2.38 is a, a shut up. No, that's not the gospel, okay? What is this talking about? Because even Catholics will say, it's water and blood. You need to be baptized in order to be saved. Remember, Catholicism is works salvation without any assurance of salvation, okay? But let's continue. For there is, For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one, okay? The Father, the soul of the Godhead. The Word. The Word made flesh. Hold your place here. Go to John chapter 1. Okay? See, these devils, these Catholic coadjutors, these Catholic infiltrators, love flesh. Love flesh. And when you refer to the flesh of Jesus Christ, the flesh as a skin suit. Oh, you're calling, you're calling Jesus a skin suit. That's my, oh, shut up, you wicked Catholic devil. No, no, no. Uh, first John, uh, John chapter 1, verse 14. The word and the word was made flesh. The flesh profiteth nothing. The flesh profiteth nothing. Sin has been relegated to the skin suit. Sin, excuse me. Sin has been relegated to the sin, uh, sin suit. <laughs> the sin suit. Yeah, flesh is basically the sin suit. Put that one on for size there, buddy boy. Yeah. Sin has been relegated to the skin suit, to the flesh, okay? And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Go back to 1 John chapter 5. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, which is the soul of the Godhead. The word, which was made flesh. And the Holy Ghost, which is the spirit. And these three are one. These three are one. The flesh profiteth nothing. It's the blood that cleanseth away our sins. Okay? The flesh profits nothing. Okay? You read Romans chapter 8, verses 1 under verse 4. Paul clearly, in conjunction to what our Lord said, the flesh is meaningless. It profiteth nothing. The flesh itself doesn't save you. The flesh itself doesn't sanctify you. Someone defending that is a Catholic. Every single time, they're a Catholic. Because that's what Catholics are. They magnify their little skin suit thing. The cookie. They magnify it. That's why they get offended when you got someone referring to the flesh that is sinful as a skin suit. Talk about that at length in many other videos. Um, so don't need to bother with it. But let's continue. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. What does this mean? The Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary, and she was with child by the Holy Ghost. Okay? Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, God manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, okay? The Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary, and Mary was with child by the Holy Ghost. Jesus was born, water, blood, the atonement of our sins. When the spear pierced the side of our Lord Jesus Christ, what came out? Water and blood. 
So when it says here, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit, which overshadowed Mary, and the water, God was manifest in the flesh. God was made of woman. You know, the flesh was made of woman. Okay, not God was made of woman. Excuse me. Beg your pardon. That's Catholic. No, uh, forgive me for saying that. That was a misspeak. But uh, the flesh, okay? The word was made flesh, okay? Okay, what is that in 1 Timothy? 1 Timothy chapter 2, I believe that is. Go there. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Ah, uh, no, no, where is that? Ah, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And without controversy, great is the mystery, mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into, go into glory. So God was manifest in the flesh. The spirit and the water and the blood, the blood shed on the cross to make atonement for our sins. Okay? To make atonement for our sins. And these three agree in one. Do you see? If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. We've already looked at that. Okay? He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And the record that he gave of his Son. One God, comprised of spirit, soul, and body. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. The Word was made flesh. Okay? Okay? Born of a woman, manifest in the flesh. Okay? Forgive me what I said earlier. I just bleh, forgive me for that. Okay? And the record that God gave of his son, the authorized version of the scriptures, which speaks against the Trinity. Trinity itself is not listed in the scripture. Neither is Bible. <laughs> okay? And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life and this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life and he that hath not the son of God hath not life. And you trinitarians you do not have the son of God. Because you demote Jesus as one of Three persons that make your satanic trinity. But now when getting back. Now we looked at all that because like I said. The Puritans. The Calvinistic Puritans would kill people. They did kill people. They put people to death. And myself. Which am against the satanic trinity. Would have been put to death by the Puritans. By their toleration act. Freedom of religion. What has freedom of religion done to America? Now, now don't get me wrong, okay? Don't get me wrong. I am for liberty of conscience. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the original intentions of liberty of conscience for America and um, the First Amendment Was, it was to speak against a religion dictated by gunpoint, by force, which is what Catholicism and the Church of England was doing. Okay? We have to remember that. But it was to serve God according to the scriptures. That's what liberty, I believe, was the original intent. Never to give place to Catholicism because Catholicism has gotten here, is here, isn't going anywhere. America cannot expel the Jesuits. They are too ingrained. They are too in control of this nation. 
And a lot of people like to search the scriptures. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Okay? Go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Now, we have to remember, when we're looking in Deuteronomy chapter 4, this is said specifically, dispensationally, doctrinally, unto the Jew, to Israel, which is not America. Okay? America is not God's chosen nation. God's chosen nation is Israel, the Jew, to this day. Okay? And his capital is Jerusalem, where he's going to rule and reign from when he come back with us at his second coming. Okay? But Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 under verse 10. Now this, remember, was said unto the Jews, Israel, not to us Americans. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land where ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes, and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and an understanding people. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day? Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen and lest, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. Now, to instruct us in righteousness. When they came over here in the 1620, and they established the Mayflower Compact, okay, they were separatists. They wanted to get away from persecution from Rome, okay? And they wanted to establish things according to the scriptures, okay? And, like I said, our Constitution is loosely based off of scriptural principles. But see, the problem is that from the virtually from the inception, okay, from the 1630s, at the very least, Catholicism has been present here. But because of the Church of the Living God, America stood to principles that for a while there could be considered godly. But in and of itself, the nation of America, in and of itself, brethren, you got to remember, since, uh, what was it, the Civil War with the 14th Amendment, okay, and I believe long, even before that, the Jesuits have long been in control of this government. Long been in control. But see, the Church of the Living God has a voice. We have a voice, brethren. Can our voice affect this government now? No. Because this government here now is set for judgment against all those who reject God. But see, you and I, as the church of the living God, we have statutes to live by. And there was a time when people wanted to come to America, the land of the free, the home of the brave. There was a time because of the church of the living God, because there were godly men within this ungodly nation. But see what happened over time. Roe versus Wade. Prayer taken out of schools. The Jesuits were underlying. Catholicism was in America all this time, just waiting for the perfect moment to arise and strike. Hence, while men of God have been in America, I do not believe at all that America was ever truly a godly nation. Ever. I don't believe it. There were men of God that dictated things onto the government that the government followed. Yes! But in and of itself, was America ever a godly nation? I don't believe so.
I don't believe so. Now, jumping a little in Deuteronomy chapter 4, let's look at verses 15 on to verse 20. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. Notice in a lot of the medical uh, things here in America, you see Nehushtan, the uh, snake around the cross, around the pole. Yeah, that's a Masonic thing. Worshipping of Nehushtan, the, the serpent in the wilderness that Moses held up. When you see medical establishments, you know, with that weird snake symbol, that's what that's symbolizing, okay? Okay? <laughs> Unless thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven... They can go ahead, but the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as ye are this day. This is spoken of Israel. Israel was supposed to be separate, to be God's example, okay? Under the law. We're in the dispensation outside of the law, even though we have law that we follow according to Scripture, because the law was there to show you your sin. You couldn't keep the law if your life depended on it, okay? You couldn't. You can't, okay? But see, for us as the church of the living God, we are to live according to the Scripture, to be an example unto the lost world. This does not apply for America, because look at what America has become! Come on! And look at verse 20, uh, verses 26 on to verse 32 in Deuteronomy chapter 4. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day, that ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land whereunto ye go over Jordan to possess it. Ye shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. The Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and ye shall be left few in number among the heathen, whither the Lord shall lead you. And there ye shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God. Now this is for you personally. This nation, America, cannot be saved. America is so far gone. America is a nation against God. The people, we, we looked at who signed our Constitution. Were some of them saved men? Maybe. I don't know. But you saw the denominations that were there. Two Catholics. And even an open deist, Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> okay? Yeah. So, individually. Because America is a nation. Could America do this? But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. See, if you do that, seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. See, our Lord will say, okay, I want you to depart from certain things. See, God is not for sin. And God wants us at the Church of the Living God to live separate than that. Okay? When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God, and shalt be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers which he sware unto them. For ask now of the days that are past, which were before thee, since the day that God created man upon the earth, and ask from the one side of heaven unto the other, whether there hath been any such thing as this great thing is, or hath been heard the like. 
or, or hath been heard like it. Excuse me. Can America do that? Hmm? Can America do that? Go to Daniel. Go to Daniel chapter four, uh, chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. We want verses 1 under verse 4. Daniel chapter 12. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Okay? This is talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. Michael, you know, is being referred to as our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise, who fear the Lord, shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars of heaven forever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Sure, knowledge is increased today, isn't it? Yeah, these Christians, ever learning and never able to come to the uh, knowledge of the truth. Why is that? Because it's run by Jesuitism. Christianity, the church building system, is in the hand of the Jesuits. You got to go to a college, right, to get a piece of paper that says God said, you, uh, that man said, you can do this, you need a piece of paper that costs upwards to $100,000. You're going to Jesuits. And they come out saying, yea, hath God said. A better translation should be. Okay? And, and go to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, verses 13 on to verse 18. Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, What have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said, It is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are delivered. Then they that feared the Lord spake one often, often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. Right there. Well, look at that. Look at this, those verses. Verses 15 and 16. Okay. And now we call the proud happy. The proud are happy today. And they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. See, this is talking about how there can be those who are wicked outside, but those who fear the Lord, who thought upon his name, the Lord hears. So this tells us what? That even though a nation can be wicked, the church of the living God within that nation, the Lord hears. Hence, that is why there has been blessings and mercy and long suffering shoot to this country of America. Why? Because of the church of the living God that is within it, not because of the government. Okay? Okay? Now, go to Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah chapter 65. Gotta watch my time here. Isaiah chapter 65, verses 11 on to verse 16. But ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop, and that furnish the drink offering unto that number. Therefore will I number you to the sword, and ye shall all bow down to the slaughter. Because when I called, ye did not answer. When I spake, ye did not hear, but did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. 
like giving Catholicism the liberty to preach her poisonous doctrines here in America. And this guy talking about expelling the Jesuits? Yet our very First Amendment allows license for Jesuitism to flourish here in America. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat, but ye shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but ye shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but ye shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart, and shall howl for vexation of spirit. And ye shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen. For the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. The Church of the living God, not Christians. That he who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth. Because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hid from mine eyes. See here a distinction between those who want to serve the devil, the world, and those who fear the Lord. There's a distinction. Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. Verses 23 on to verse 33, the close of the chapter. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure, there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there... If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again and said, Peradventure, there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure, there shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure, there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak yet but, but this once. Peradventure, ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way. As soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place, onto his place. Abraham acting as intercessor. Ultimately, because he knew Lot was there. And the Lord kind of figured uh, eventually uh, Abraham would whittle him down to just Lot. But the point is, someone who is of God interceding because of someone, Lot, who was a just man, according to scripture, Abraham pleading for the just that was in an ungodly nation. What does this mean? Exodus chapter 11. Exodus chapter 11. Exodus chapter 11. Verse 7. But against the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue, against man or beast, that ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference 
between the Egyptians, those of the world, and Israel. That's what this means. A difference between those of the world and those who are of God. So see, also two, also two, Second Thessalonians chapter two. Let's let the scripture answer this. Second Thessalonians chapter two. See, you guys want the, the new world order? You guys want new stuff coming in? Pray the Lord redeem his purchased possession. Then all you devil Jesuit coadjutors, you can have this place. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 5 on to verse 12. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know that what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity, of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. He is the church of the living God, the body of Christ. Until he be taken out of the way. God is, God is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. He knows everything. He's everywhere. He's not going to go anywhere. The he that is being talked about is the church of the living God, his body, the body of Christ, being redeemed before the time of Jacob's trouble, being caught up. Okay? He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The church of the living God is keep in America. The church of the living God is that which is withholding utter destruction upon this nation. And destruction will come. The economy is going to collapse. But the utter devastation and destruction of America... Will not the God of all the world, uh, will not the judge of all the earth do right? Is he going to firebomb America with his body in it? I don't think so. Until we be taken out of the way. So see, we look at this, why? To show you that an ungodly government that has never been godly, America, can have things given onto it by God because of the intercession of the church of the living God, praying for the church of the living God, his body within that wicked nation. That's why America has been able to prosper as it has for years and years and years and years and years. Even from its inception, when Catholicism was there all along, waiting just for the perfect moment to strike. And she has. I don't think America was ever a godly nation. Ever. Ever. God has, been, uh, God has blessed America, yes. Why? Because of the church of the living God that's in it. Not because it of itself is a godly nation. The presence of the church of the living God has, given, has been unto America the blessing of America. Not because America in and of itself even though that is loosely based upon uh, things in Scripture, loosely. But then again, you don't see the name of God in there, Jesus Christ. Why? Because the people who founded that, who wrote that, were primarily all Freemasons. America was never a godly nation. America received favor because of the church of the living God that was within it. That's the point. Okay, now verse 8. Now after we are taken up, and then shall that wicked be revealed, that man of sin, the son of perdition, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness, deceivableness of unrighteousness, and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. God shall send them strong delusion, 
Just believe and you're saved. God loves you. God's not mad at you. God's not going to judge you. God's love is unconditional. God's going to make America great again. <laughs> you know, I, I, I see these people who keep talking about America can come back. America can come back. You guys need to get your head out from uh, from betwixt your buttocks. Trying to redeem, trying to pray for God, to God for to deliver America or to make America a godly nation. America never was a godly nation. Never! But we as the Church of the Living God ask for God's mercy because we don't know who he's going to save today who is in this country. Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 under verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, the, he, the heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me, and where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is of, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. There were those back in um, uh, earlier times here in America, like Thanksgiving, who did tremble at their word, at the word of God. And Thanksgiving was to be a day of fasting and prayer, not of gluttony and Romish sports entertainment. Okay? Yes, because of the Church of the Living God in America, the Church of the Living God was able to, through the mercies and grace of God, influence things in this country. But over time, Romanism, Jesuitism has prevailed. And so many that claim to be of us were not of us and they have backslid they they how can you backslide from something you're not a part of but they were made manifest that they were not of us giving themselves over to catholicism to the rule of this nation which is a jesuit nation america is a jesuit nation you people need to understand this america is not coming back And could America today tremble at God's word, the authorized version of the scriptures? Give me a break. He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man. He that sacrificeth a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation as if he offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways. And their soul delighteth in their abominations. I also will choose their delusions. And will bring their fears upon them. Because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear. But they did evil before mine eyes. And chose that in which I delighted not. Is that you? You got someone warning you. You got someone here warning you of these things. What are you going to do? You're going to continue in what God hates and justify it through religion? Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said the Lord, said, let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy. And they shall be ashamed. There comes a time when they which kill you think they do God's service. Look at that verse. Hear the word of the Lord. Ye that tremble at his word. Do you tremble at the words of scripture? I do. Your brethren that hated you. Only in name. You know, these Christians. That cast you out for my name's sake said. Let the Lord be glorified. Yeah, but he shall appear to your joy and they shall be ashamed. 
Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2. Verses 11 on to verse 13. Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Again, this is specifically talking about Israel, the Jew, the Hebrew. Instruction and in righteousness. But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. We of the church of the living God, we haven't done that. But this nation sure has. Do these Christians... Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, saith the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me the fountain of living waters and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They have forsaken our Lord Jesus Christ long ago. This nation, even in pretense, has forsaken the Lord Jesus Christ and made... America has made itself its own gods, given to them by Catholicism. And of course, Jeremiah chapter, oh, no, well in chapter 2, verses 17, no, nah, we won't read that. Go to Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6. Verses 10 on to verse 19. Church and living God. In America, God, God is done with this nation. America is not going to be turned around. But to every individual you meet, whom the Lord will or orchestrate, whatever, by living according to the scripture. We have to be mindful of the individual, not the nation. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hear. Behold, behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. Therefore I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the aged with him that is full of days, and their houses shall be turned unto others with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace. When there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay. They were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, like Abraham did, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. Also I sent watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. Therefore hear, ye nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. Is that you? Again, a na this nation here in America, forget it. It's gone. How are you living according to the scriptures, brother, sister? Are you living according to this outside so that they may all behold how you adhere to the scriptures? Are you being a testimony unto the lost? Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18. We're almost done. 
Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 13 on to verse 17. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Ask ye now among the heathen, Who hath heard such things? The virgin of Israel hath done a very horrible thing. Will a man leave the snow of Lebanon, which cometh from the rock of the field? Or shall the cold flowing waters that come from another place be forsaken? Because my people hath forgotten me, they have burned incense to vanity, and they have caused them to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths, to walk in paths in a way not cast up, to make their land desolate and a perpetual hissing. Every one that passeth thereby shall be astonished and wag his head. I will scatter them as with an east wind before the enemy. I will shew them the back and not the face in the day of their calamity. This is the future of America. Even though in context, doctrinally and dispensationally, this is talking about Israel. And this God did to the apple of his eye. America is not the apple of God's eye. America is not Babylon. America is not God's nation. America is the Jesuits nation. Okay? And look at verse 18. What happens to those of us who speak, especially nowadays, with censorship? Then said they, verse 18 in Jeremiah 18, Then said they, Come and let us devise devices against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come, and let us smite him with the tongue, and let us not give heed to any of his words. With those devils out there who do whispering campaigns and attack those of the church of the living God who preach the truth of the scriptures. <laughs> you know, if you really, if you really do believe that there's coming a time of great prosperity in America, you're nuts. You are insane. You're crazy. America's done. But see, what we got to do here, go to Psalm 108. Psalm 108. Psalm 108. Psalm 108. Come on, fingers work with me. There we go. Psalm 108. God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise, even with my glory. Awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. Your witness, your testimony, outside there, how you live according to the scriptures. And I will sing praises unto thee among the nations. In the nation that you live, live as the church of the living God in your pagan, heathen, Catholic nation. For thy mercy is great above the heavens, and thy truth reacheth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens, and thy glory above all the earth that thy beloved may be delivered. Save with thy right hand and answer me. Now see, verses 1 under verse 6, six are dealing with the individual, with personal. Save me, answer me. I will. Okay, I my, uh, verse 1, I will sing. Verse 2, I myself. Verse 3, I will praise. I will sing praises. I will praise thee. I will sing praises. For thy mercy is truth, uh, for thy mercy is great above the heavens, and thy truth reacheth unto the clouds. Okay? Verse 6. And answer me. See, verses 1 under verse 6 deal with the individual within a nation. Verses 7 on verse 13. God has spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem. And meet out the valley of Sukkoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the strength of mine head. Judah is my lawgiver. Moab is my washpot. Over Edom will I cast out my shoe. Over Philista will I triumph. 
Who will bring me into the strong city? Who will lead me into a dome? So someone who is of the church of the living God, as has happened a fourth time in America, the church of the living God can influence an ungodly nation run by Catholics. Yes, yes, because God will honor those of his body in that pagan nation. Wilt not thou, O God, who has cast us off? And wilt not thou, O God, go forth with our, host, our hosts? Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. All the while they are saying, peace and safety. And there is no peace. The, through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. You know, people like to talk about Second Chronicles chapter 7, but they ignore the context about where, you know, I will heal your land, but the nation needs to repent. Um, can America do this? Joel chapter 2. Then we'll be done. Joel chapter 2. Joel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Joel chapter 2, verses 12 on to verse 17. Can America do this? No. Can you, as an individual, a person, spiritual and body, do this? Therefore also, therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. America as a whole cannot do this. But you can. And rend your heart, and not your garment. And turn unto, your, unto the Lord our, your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent, and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? See, rend your heart and not your garment. Converted from the inside, being broken of your self-righteousness, contrite over the sin that you have committed against God. It's your fault that he was crucified. And in fear of the Lord that he can send you to hell righteously. Call upon his name. Call upon the name of the Lord and may he save you and make you a new creature. You can do this. America can't. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children. And those that suck the breasts, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Verse 17. These Christians in these church buildings, can they do this? No, they're busy talking to you about how God loves you unconditionally, that you're saved by you just believing, that you shouldn't judge Catholics, that you shouldn't judge, period. You know, like I said, brethren, America is gone, never coming back. But we as the Church of the Living God here in America, we ought to pray daily that the Lord spare us, spare this nation, because we do not know who the Lord is going to save today. And that we as the Church of the Living God may be strong, bold, and courageous out there amongst these people, that they may see in us a new creature, and that we may be as ambassadors of our Lord Jesus Christ, hold the, having the ministry of reconciliation 
and the word of reconciliation. Now is not the time to quit. Whatever nation you're in, now is not the time to quit. Now is not the time to quit. You don't defeat the enemy by joining the enemy. Unbelievable. So that, that's, that's it. That's it for this video. Going to be a lot of links in the description box. Uh, you can very well disagree with me. America was never a godly nation. It was the church of the living God that influenced this ungodly nation. And we've already looked at in the scriptures that thus can be the case. It wasn't that America in and of itself was a godly nation. No. It was because of the presence of the church of the living God. That's why America has been blessed. That's why destruction is being held off. Utter destruction. We need to pray, brethren. We need to be diligent for the truth. Like I told you, never mind our country. It's too far gone. The Jesuits are in control. What we need to worry about is living our lives according to the scriptures, examining ourselves daily, hi, okay, and living according to the scriptures, okay? That is what we need to do. And to be devoid of all ourselves, that we may be vessels meet for the master's use out there in whatever circumstance he orchestrates to use you for, to witness onto these lost people. Because winter is coming. Getting out isn't going to be as easy, at least for us. Take heed to these things and consider. Please consider these things. And do not forget. Do not forget. America belongs to Roman Catholicism. And we are behind enemy lines, brethren. Pray to the Lord for his long suffering, for his mercy upon this nation. We do every morning because we don't know who he's going to save today. That's going to be it for this video. Um, a lot of stuff here, <laughs> of course. Thank you so much for watching this if you do. Um, Lord willing, there will be another video tomorrow, Lord willing. And, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, brethren. Thank you to all of you who pray for us, those of you who help us. Um, thank you for those of you who are in contact with us personally, uh, for your patience. Like I said, we've been having a lot of stuff going on lately. And, uh, just, again, thank you. We love you. Thank you. And pray for one another, brethren. And whatever nation you are in, pray for our God's mercy upon your nation, that whomever he will save in your nation may be saved today. Because when there ain't no one left who's going to be saved, who he's going to save. So anyway, thank you, brethren. We love you. And we will see you in the next video.